There are few natural areas in Canada more magnificent than the Rocky Mountains. That succession of snow-capped ranges, which run along the border of Canada's westernmost provinces, Alberta and British Columbia. Every year, tourists from all over the world flock to the mountain towns of Jasper, Banff, and Lake Louise to hike, ski, or simply take in the sights of these jewels in the rugged crown of the Great White North. Beneath its breathtaking exterior of emerald lakes, majestic peaks, and crisp coniferous forests, this northern stretch of the America's continental divide harbors dark secrets best shared around the cherry glow of an evening campfire. Stories of ghosts, strange animals, lost gold, and Indian curses, these timeless tales transport us back through the region's rich history, from the heyday of the Grand Railway Hotels to a time when crystal waters reflected the hazy plumes of smoke-stained teepees. In this video, we will explore some of these forgotten mysteries of Canada's Rocky Mountains. The oldest stories endemic to the Canadian Rockies are the oral traditions of its First Nations, who have called the region home for centuries. Long before fur trade explorers first ventured into the mountain passes, native storytellers told tales about frightening animals that haunted the slopes, lurking atop lonely crags, in secluded valleys, and within glacial lakes. One monster which native tradition says roves the Rocky Mountains is a hairy giant, reminiscent of the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. This wild man appears in the folklore of the Stonies or Nakoda, whose traditional homeland lies in the heart of the Canadian Rockies, encompassing Banff National Park. These big creatures, wrote Canadian politician Grant McEwen, appear to have been the Rocky Mountain versions of the abominable snowmen. Stonies did not hide their fear of the eight or nine feet tall giants. McEwen explained that when hunters, fishermen, or berry pickers mysteriously vanished in the mountains, their disappearances were often attributed to these elusive wild men, who had a penchant for kidnapping both men and women. Another Rocky Mountain tribe with stories about alpine giants are the Shushwap, an interior Salish people whose sprawling territory, which stretches across British Columbia's interior plateau, extends into the northwestern edge of the Canadian Rockies, encompassing much of Jasper National Park. Anthropologist James Tate described the Shushwap giant legend in 1909, writing that the wild men were said to be quite numerous in Shushwap country until the latter half of the 19th century. They were swift runners and excellent hunters, whose powerful frames allowed them to easily haul black bear, deer, and other large game along the mountainsides. Contrary to the ideas of the Stony, the giants of Shushwap tradition rarely bothered people, although they sometimes stole fish from nets and drying racks. They are of a grey complexion, Tate wrote, and probably on that account, and also because of their tallness, they are often called bleached or grey trees. They are also called burned trees, probably because at a great distance they all look black. Far from being relegated to the campfire stories of yesteryear, Tales of mountain-dwelling giants persist in the Canadian Rockies to this very day, fueled by a handful of chilling 20th century encounters, which we will explore later in this piece. Other human-like creatures said to haunt the Rocky Mountains are the Little People, diminutive dwarf-like men and women said to live in caves beneath the mountains. Grant McEwen touched on the stony conception of these preternatural pygmies, writing, Not many Indians actually saw them but hunters often discovered tiny footprints and heard mysterious noises. Two stonies told of pursuing wounded bighorn sheep into a mountain cave, and there hearing voices of little men speaking from below, plotting to make war on the surface dwellers. Another exposition on the dwarf legend appears in the writings of Sebastian Chumak, who reproduced an old story told by stony elder Jonas Dixon. Dixon explained that the little people, whom he called the Makuya Debe, were associated with the West Wind, and were believed to be descended from bears who were transformed into tiny people as divine punishment for their mischievous antics. The little people, he said, are very small persons. No bigger than a badger, these underground persons live deep within the earth, where it is always the spring moon. They have their own underground country. They weave braided flowers and know very little sorrow. Their singing is like the prairie burning and flowering. One stony man who claimed to have seen the mountain dwarves was a hunter named Hector Crawler, a resident of Morley, Alberta, 
who spent much of the late 19th and early 20th centuries roaming the Albertan Rockies in search of game. Crawler told his experience to Norman Luxton, one of the first prominent residents of Banff, Alberta, who earned himself the moniker Mr. Banff. Luxton told Crawler's incredible story to Canadian ethnographer Marius Barbeau, who published it in his 1960 book, Indian Days in the Western Prairies. A certain time when he was in the mountains, Luxton said of Crawler, when alone, he saw what he called the little black men, describing them to me as elfish, not fairy forms. He described them to me as elves, wearing little plug hats and cutaway coats, and while he could not carry on a conversation with the elf, he was sure that it was out of the ordinary to have a vision of that kind. It was a rare novelty. Following his strange experience, Hector Crawler delved into the mysteries of his tribe, becoming a medicine man and healer of considerable renown. He spent much of his time in seclusion, hunting alone in the mountains, particularly in the Kootenai Plains west of Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, the site of another strange event we will touch on later. Some stony today firmly maintain that the little people who populate the legends of their forefathers still inhabit the Canadian Rockies and their easterly foothills. In an article published on Halloween 2021, journalist Jordan Small stated that the elusive and benevolent Wichita Juthin Min, as his informant Daxter Amos called them, are still spotted from time to time in the stony town of Morley, Alberta, particularly near the schools. Every once in a while, while mopping the floors of the local high school after hours, custodians are said to catch glimpses of tiny people darting across the hallway before disappearing. And stony berry pickers have reported finding tiny ladders in the woods, which disappear before they can be shown to others. Another monster said to lurk in Canada's Rocky Mountain forest is a sort of giant predatory owl. Allusions to this ghostly nocturnal bird appear in the traditions of the Kootenai, the southernmost of the indigenous peoples in the Canadian Rockies. Legend has it that, in the mists of prehistory, Kopi, the owl, was a hulking, man-eating monster that made its home in the deep woods. Drawn by the sound of crying children, Kopi stole into native villages in the night and snatched the little ones from their beds, carrying them off to his sylvan lair. Every evening, as darkness spread over the forest, fearful mothers hushed their children, listening with bated breath for the dreaded hoot at the edge of the firelight, which told them that Kopi was on the prowl. Kopi proved such a menace to men and animals that Coyote, the trickster, took it upon himself to mitigate his power. Not knowing the location of Kopi's nest, Coyote assumed the appearance of a crying child and was duly snatched up by the avian predator. After a long flight over the forest and across the mountains, the bawling imposter was deposited in a spacious nest where more than a hundred children were held captive. He wiped out his tears as his feathered abductor spread his wings and glided silently away in search of firewood. As soon as the monster was out of sight, Coyote told his fellow prisoners that they would see their families again, as long as they did exactly as he told them. When the giant owl returned with a load of firewood, he found his captives dancing merrily around a fire to the throb of his own drum, singing, Kopi likes us, Kopi likes us. Pleased that the children seemed to be ignorant of his true intentions, the yellow-eyed predator encouraged the revelry and soon began to take part himself, joining the dancing circle. Coyote waited until Kopi was thoroughly engrossed in the exercise before pushing him onto the fire. The giant owl burned up, and from his smoldering embers flew regular owls, from which all modern members of the species are descended. Incredibly, there is evidence that giant man-eating owls may be more than creatures of native legend. According to Jordan Small's informants, the Stoney believe that a giant owl, resembling the legendary Kopi of Kootenai mythology, may still haunt the Rocky Mountains. This ghastly, shape-shifting entity is called the Baptha, or Howler, and can sometimes be heard shrieking at night in the woods beyond Chenicky Lake. Quoting filmmaker Jared Two Young Men, a stony native from Morley, Small Road. It's something that a lot of people are afraid to talk about, even elders, and especially at night. Although the Howler is supposed to have the ability to assume a variety of different forms, it most often appears to hapless witnesses as a large owl, 
with the head of a man and the legs of a horse. It has been spotted looming in the forest canopy, scanning the forest floor with glowing yellow eyes. The sight of it is believed to cause temporary paralysis. Legend has it that the monster is the spirit of a stony Indian who became lost in the woods near Chiniki Lake, transformed into its hideous form by the sinister power which some say pervades the area. Two young men claimed to have encountered the Howler himself in the early 2000s, while living alone in a house near Chiniki Lake. One night, after coming home from powwow practice, the filmmaker heard coyotes howling outside and opened his window to let in the wild music. About ten minutes later, the coyotes abruptly stopped their yipping. Suddenly, it just went silent, the filmmaker told Small. I remember it being silent, so I peeked out my window, and it was dead silent. And then I heard the screaming, coming toward my house. It was terrifying. It was a scream that I had never heard before, like the scream of an owl or something. It was the most terrifying screaming I had ever heard. I can't describe it, so I got spooked. I shut the window and I grabbed my dog and just huddled under the window and just turned all the lights off. Giant owls are not the only avian monsters said to soar above the Rocky Mountains. Like other First Nations across the country, the indigenous peoples of the Canadian Rockies believed in the existence of giant horned eagles with the ability to create thunder and lightning which made their nests in high cliffs, hunting large game and human beings. Although there were many names for these colossal raptors, ethnologists generally refer to them as thunderbirds. According to Jonas Dixon, the Stoney called these preternatural beings Mu, and regarded them as powerful allies of humanity. In one traditional story, a thunderbird battled a huge horned water snake near the Rocky Mountain Trench, not far from present-day Field, British Columbia. The powerful Blackfoot, who lived in the prairies east of the Rockies, have traditional stories about thunderbirds that lived in the high mountains, who sometimes left their alpine eyries to hunt bison and human beings in the foothills. The Blackfoot called this creature Omaxipitao, a word which means big golden eagle. The Blackfoot tell a story about a Cree medicine man named White Bear, who was abducted by a thunderbird in the winter of 1850, when he was 28 years old, and lived to tell the tale. At that time, White Bear's band was encamped south of Fort Edmonton, Alberta, an old Hudson's Bay Company post on the North Saskatchewan River. Hunting had been poor the previous fall, and their pemmican stores were low. With fresh meat hard to come by at that time of the winter, the band was in desperate straits. In a deviation from custom, White Bear and a handful of hunters wandered west into the Rocky Mountains in search of game. Mysteriously, members of the party began to disappear one by one leaving behind no clues as to their fates. Undaunted by this disturbing development, the hunters decided to split up and spread out in order to give themselves a better chance of finding food. One day, while camped east of present-day Banff, Alberta, White Bear came across a deer. He brought the animal down and set to butchering it. When he had finished dressing the carcass, he packed the meat onto his back and headed east. Suddenly, the hunter was surrounded by the shadow of an enormous bird. Before he knew what was happening, White Bear found himself rising into the air. With a thrill of horror, he realized that an Amoxipatau had grabbed hold of the meat he had packed and was carrying him off to its lair. After a terrifying journey over the mountains, White Bear landed in an enormous nest built atop a high cliff. Bones of various animals lay about him. Some of these were unmistakably human likely the last remains of the missing hunters. Also in the nest were two baby Amaxipatau, for whom he knew he was intended. Realizing that his life depended on his speedy escape, White Bear seized the bird's legs and jumped out of the nest with them. The baby birds flapped their wings furiously, slowing their descent, and the hunter landed on the ground unharmed. He plucked two arm-length feathers from the baby bird's tails as souvenirs of his adventure, and struck out east for the prairies. In another Blackfoot story, 
a band of natives encamped in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains were plagued by some swift and mysterious predator, which snatched up lone men and horses when no one was around to witness what became of them. A white shepherd who lived in the area offered the natives his unsolicited advice, suggesting that the missing horses and their riders had probably been taken by a strange bird he had seen. He offered to kill the creature for a price. The natives ignored the white man and attempted to kill the creature themselves, but all who fired at it were carried off into the mountains. When some of their best hunters were slain, they took the shepherd up on his offer. Before doing battle, the white man killed thirty of his sheep, skinned them, and made himself a thick suit of armor. Thus clad, he sought out the Thunderbird and began shooting at it, but was unable to harm it. Like his unfortunate predecessors, he was snatched up and flown away. The shepherd was transported to a huge nest high in the mountains, where a hungry fledgling awaited him. Escaping the talons of his abductor, the man found a stick and managed to club both Thunderbirds to death. Like White Bear, he cut off a few of the bird's arm-length tail feathers and brought them home. Like giant owls, alpine dwarves, and mountain wild men, sightings of giant raptors evoking the Thunderbirds of native lore have been reported in the relatively recent past. In 2004, cryptozoologist Mark A. Hall reproduced a story that he unearthed in Canadian naturalist Dan McCowan's 1936 book, Animals of the Canadian Rockies. In 1925, hikers reported seeing an enormous eagle near the Tower of Babel, a mountain whose base lies just five miles south of Lake Louise, and a mere 13 miles from the site of the legendary battle between the Thunderbird and the giant water snake. McCowan wrote that these outdoorsmen saw an eagle flying at considerable height. As it neared the tower, it came much lower, and they observed that the big brown bird carried an animal of considerable size in its talons. The bird subsequently dropped its prey, which proved to be a mule deer fawn weighing 15 pounds, or nearly 7 kilograms, double the carrying capacity of the average golden eagle, the most powerful known raptor in the Canadian Rockies. No exposition on the native legends of the Canadian Rockies would be complete without a nod to Spirit Island, one of Canada's most iconic landmarks. This tiny, picturesque isle, crowned with a coronet of spruce trees, lies at the center of Maline Lake in Jasper National Park, amid pine forest and snow-capped mountains. As its name suggests, this enchanting islet is associated with a haunting ghost story, the origin of which has long been lost to history. According to a popular iteration of this tale, told to passengers of the Maline Lake boat cruise, which reports to be a traditional stony legend, the island was the secret meeting place of two star-crossed lovers whose respective tribes were at war. When the girl's father learned of this illicit romance, he forbade her from returning to the island and kept a strict watch over her to prevent her disobedience. Sick with grief, the girl fell ill and died. The Romeo of this Rocky Mountain tragedy unaware of these developments, waited for his Juliet in the shade of the island's spruce boughs, and died there of a broken heart when it became clear that she would not return to him. Today, the spirit of the young man haunts the island, waiting in vain for his lost love. Another legend set on Spirit Island is a werewolf story, which appears in a 1983 stony ethnography. This two-part tale revolves around a pair of orphaned brothers who were raised by wolves on Maline Lake after their mother was killed by a raider from the prairies. One of the brothers, named Scraping Wolf, took well to his new lupine lifestyle, while the other brother, named Star Robe, pined for human company. One day, the brothers were visited by a medicine man named Braided Rawhide Necklace, who accidentally dropped four sacred blue stones in the water. When Star Robe retrieved these items from the bottom of the lake, the medicine man rewarded him by giving him his daughter's hand in marriage. Star Robe left the island to live with his wife, named White Hand, in the village of Braided Rawhide Necklace, while Scraping Wolf remained behind with the wolves. Eventually, after praying to the night spirits of Maline Lake, Scraping Wolf transformed into a wolf himself and went to live in the mountains with his lupine brothers. The second half of the story begins with Star Robe's return to Spirit Island and reunion with Scraping Wolf. Star Robe informs his brother that his wife and father were really preternatural entities 
which he called Evil Walkers, or Snake People, who had lured him from the island with powerful magic. After calling on the spirits of Malene Lake to transform his evil wife into a pile of brown pebbles, Starrobe stole the blue stones from Braided Rawhide Necklace and returned to Spirit Island. When he found that Scraping Wolf's lupine transformation was permanent, he used the blue stones to assume the form of a wolf himself, and resolved to never abandon his brother again. Like the tale of the Starcrossed Lovers, this Rocky Mountain epic ends in tragedy, with Scraping Wolf being eaten by water creatures after failing to heed a prophecy. The wolves of Malene Lake blame the death on Starrobe, whom they confront on Spirit Island. The surviving brother successfully defends himself, and heads east in search of his mother's people. The first white men to set foot in the Canadian Rockies were voyageurs under the command of David Thompson, a Welsh surveyor employed at the time by the Great Fur Trading Syndicate, the Northwest Company, or NWC. Concerned by the success of the recent Lewis and Clark expedition, in which a group of U.S. Army volunteers successfully marched across the continent, reaching the mouth of the Columbia River on the Pacific Ocean in 1805, the NWC hoped to find an efficient route to the Upper Columbia, so that it might establish a presence there before any American syndicates. Although Northwest Company explorers Alexander Mackenzie and Simon Fraser had already made their way west across the Great Divide by way of the northerly Peace River, the company hoped to find a quicker passage through that great and treacherous barrier, the Rocky Mountains, and tasked David Thompson with its discovery. In 1806, Thompson and his crew crossed the Rocky Mountains by way of House Pass, an old Indian trail east of present-day Red Deer, Alberta, and established a post near what is now the town of Invermere, British Columbia, on the upper Columbia River just beyond the Rockies' western edge. In 1811, the Northwest Company learned that the Pacific Fur Company, a syndicate newly established by the wealthy German-American fur baron John Jacob Astor, was hoping to bring the fur trade to the watershed of the Columbia River, so recently opened by Lewis and Clark. Hoping to check the success of these new competitors, the NWC tasked Thompson with reaching the mouth of the Columbia River before the Astorians, as Pacific Fur Company agents were known, necessitating another journey west across the Rocky Mountains. Unfortunately for Thompson, the pig and Blackfoot of the Prairies, angered by the NWC's new trading relationship with their westerly Shushwap enemies, had blockaded the House Pass. Left with little alternative, Thompson and his men set out on Snowshoe, in search of an alternative southerly route through the Rockies. In his various writings, which several historians have since compiled and reworked into flowing narratives, which masquerade as the explorer's single definitive journal, Thompson described a strange discovery he and his men made on January 7, 1811, just prior to the recension of the Athabasca Pass, west of present-day Jasper, Alberta. At about three o'clock in the afternoon, Thompson, his four native guides, and seven French-Canadian voyageurs under his charge, came across the tracks of a large and mysterious animal, which were clearly impressed in the four to eight inches of snow that covered the ground. Whatever made the tracks appeared to have walked south for some time, before heading back into the forest. According to the natives, all of them expert trackers, the strange prince appeared to be about six hours old. Each track consisted of a large circular impression, which Thompson called the ball of the foot, crowned with four large toes, tipped with short, thick claws. Using his folding ivory ruler, the explorer determined that the tracks measured 14 inches in length and 8 inches in width. The toes were between 3 to 4 inches long, and the hind part of the foot did not make a substantial imprint in the snow. Thompson's native guides believed that the tracks had been made by an animal which, from their description, could only be a young woolly mammoth, claiming that those ancient elephants could sometimes be found at the headwaters of the Athabasca River. Those huge herbivores, they claimed, stood about 18 feet high and slept standing upright, leaning against large trees. They suspected that their legs did not have joints, but had not yet had the opportunity to verify their suspicion, as none of them had managed to kill one. They told the explorer that it would be futile and dangerous to pursue the particular specimen into the forest, as their musket balls would only succeed in wounding and angering it. An incredulous Thompson proposed that the tracks were actually made by an old grizzly bear, whose claws had worn down, a theory which he himself did not fully believe. The natives simply shook their heads, and tacitly expressed their desire to move on to which the explorer reluctantly acceded. 
The sight of the track of that large beast staggered me, Thompson acknowledged in a later reminiscence, adding that, in the thirty years that separated the incident from the time in which he penned his memoir, he had often cast his mind back to that strange winter day in 1811, puzzling over the mystery of the tracks. The native belief that a population of woolly mammoths abode in the Athabasca River country in the early 19th century was attested to in the writings of Thompson's contemporary, an Irishman named Ross Cox, who began his career by working for the NWC's aforementioned competitor, the Pacific Fur Company. Following the dissolution of the PFC in 1813, Cox, like many of his fellow Astorians, was hired by the NWC and dispatched to various posts throughout the so-called Columbia District and what are now the American states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. In his 1832 memoir, Cox wrote, Some of the Upper Crees, a tribe who inhabit the country in the vicinity of the Athabasca River, have a curious tradition with respect to animals which they state formerly frequented the mountains. They allege that these animals were of frightful magnitude, being from two to three hundred feet in length, and high in proportion, that they formerly lived in the plains, a great distance to the eastward, from which they were gradually driven by the Indians to the Rocky Mountains, that they destroyed all smaller animals, and if their agility was equal to their size, would have also destroyed all the natives, etc. One man asserted that his grandfather told him he saw one of those animals in a mountain pass, where he was hunting, and that on hearing its roar, which he compared to loud thunder, the sight almost left his eyes, and his heart became as small as an infant's. Whether such an animal ever existed, I shall leave to the curious in natural history to determine, but if the Indian tradition have any foundation in truth, it may have been the mammoth, some of whose remains have been found at various times in the United States. Following its discovery by David Thompson, the Athabasca Pass became the Norwester's preferred route across the Rocky Mountains. When the Northwest Company was absorbed by its great British-backed competitor, the Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, in 1821, the pass became part of a major brigade route by which furs and supplies were transferred across the continent. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, fur trade explorers and government surveyors explored alternative passages through the Canadian Rockies. In 1825, HBC agent James McMillan traversed the Yellowhead Pass under the guidance of a Métis frontiersman named Pierre Bostonnet, nicknamed Tête Jeune, or Yellowhead, for his blonde hair. In 1841, Sir George Simpson, the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, became the first white man to cross the Rockies by way of the Simpson Pass, southwest of Banff, Alberta, led by a French Cree Métis guide named Louis Piche, also known as the Wildcat. Around the same time, Métis settlers from Manitoba's Red River Valley promised HBC land in the West Coast, made their way across the southerly White Man's Pass in Kananaskis country, guided by a young mountain Cree warrior named Maskapatoon, or Broken Arm. In the summer of 1858, members of the Palliser Expedition explored three new passes through the Canadian Rockies. Palliser geologist Dr. James Hector explored the Vermilion Pass across the Bow River from Castle Mountain, and the Kicking Horse Pass between Field and Lake Louise naming the latter after an incident in which he was kicked in the chest by a horse and knocked unconscious. And naturalist Thomas Blackiston, who had disagreements with expedition leader John Palliser, struck out on his own and independently explored the South Kootenai Pass in what is now Waterton Lakes National Park. These expeditions led white men into uncharted territory that had only felt the soft tread of Indian moccasins, into one of the most mysterious sectors of the Rocky Mountains, where ghosts still lingered and monsters still roamed. For centuries, various First Nations across the Northwestern Plains have recognized a certain Rocky Mountain landmark as being imbued with special otherworldly power. As early as 1792, agents of the Hudson's Bay Company were aware of a sinister-looking peak, which the natives called the Devil's Head, a sharp protrusion of black limestone on which snow never seems to fall, which looks out over the foothills northwest of present-day Calgary, Alberta. This infernal landmark serves as the guidepost marking the gateways to twin veils riddled with similarly ghoulish names like Devil's Gap, Phantom Craig, Ghost Valley, and Dead Man Hill. As explorer Walter Dwight Wilcox aptly put it, with a gap, a large lake, and a mountain a short distance to the north called the Devil's Head, named after him, 
His satanic majesty seems to have a mortgage on all this region. Along the southern foot of the Devil's Head runs the Ghost River, a tributary of the Bow River. This mountain waterway owes its eerie name to an old stony legend, which, like all good folk tales, has a number of different versions. According to one version of the legend, long ago, the stony of the Rocky Mountains were embroiled in a bitter civil war, which pitted band against band and brother against brother. During this conflict, one stony band made camp on the northern shores of the Ghost River, pitching their teepees close together so that they might be better prepared to defend themselves in the event of a raid. One night, these people heard a rumbling upriver, which sounded like a herd of bison stampeding toward them. The sounds of snorts and beating hooves came closer and closer in an alarming crescendo, finally hurtling past them with a deafening roar. In spite of the darkness, the Indians could clearly make out the hulking forms of buffalo racing along the riverbank. Amid the flurry of horns and wool rode a naked Indian astride a gray horse who appeared to be driving the buffalo, a lone eagle feather mounted proudly in his hair. Determined to identify this shadowy madman, one stony warrior leapt onto his horse and galloped after the herd. The brave in pursuit pushed his horse faster and faster, said an old stony storyteller. He wanted to see the face of the rider of the gray horse. He wanted to find out who was chasing the buffalo and why he was stampeding them in the dark of night. When he finally rode up beside the gray horse, the rider and the buffalo herd disappeared into the mists of the night along the river. No one could ever catch them because they were ghosts. That is why the river is called the Ghost River. Another more popular story tells of a great battle that was fought long ago between the Stonies and the Blackfoot on the banks of the Ghost River. This clash took place when a band of Blackfoot made an incursion into Stony territory in a very uncharacteristic fishing trip, apparently being unable to find any buffalo on the prairie. One storyteller placed the battlefield on the east bank of the Ghost River, north of its junction with the Bow, where farmers and ranchers who owned property in the area have unearthed human skulls, bones, and arrowheads in their fields. It is said that many of the fallen warriors were later buried in a wooded area atop what is known as Dead Man's Hill, a rise in the land just northwest of Ghost Lake. As one stony elder put it, ever after the battle, the voices of the slain could be heard from across the river during the night. Nakota people were always anxious to get across the river and arrive home before nightfall. This sentiment was echoed by another storyteller, a resident of the battle site, who wrote, I myself can remember, many years ago, seeing stony Indians lashing their horses to a gallop to get across the river before sundown, if they happened to get late and the sun was setting. Another specter said to rise from this ancient battlefield is the shade of a Blackfoot warrior, who met his end by falling off a cut bank and drowning in the Ghost River. Ever since, the phantom of this unfortunate brave has been seen riding up and down the riverbank after sunset, seated backwards on his horse with a lance in his hand. Five miles southwest of the Devil's Head, and 15 minutes north of Banff, Alberta, lies a three-mile-long glacial lake called Lake Minnewanka. Like other lakes with similarly-sounding names in North Dakota and Michigan, Lake Minnewanka's wild-sounding appellation derives from an old Siouan Indian term, which translates to spirit water. Before 1888, this body of water was generally referred to as Devil's Lake, or Devil's Head Lake, owing its name to the storied mountain which overlooks it. And according to a local missionary, this crisp glacial lake was once also referred to as Wendigo Lake, the Wendigo or Wendigo being an evil cannibalistic spirit of Cree and Algonquin tradition. Like the grimly styled landmarks that surround it, Lake Minnewanka is shrouded in an aura of mystery befitting its sinister name. One of the oldest and best known legends surrounding this quiet mountain hideaway contends that the lake is home to some sort of monster. According to a widely disseminated story, which appeared in Canadian newspapers as early as 1924, one of the first Indians who saw this lake did so from the summit of one of the highest mountains which surrounds it. In the lake, he saw an enormous fish, so large that, from where he stood, it appeared to be as long as the lake. Another version of this lake monster legend can be found in the Banff Trading Post, a historic gift shop established in 1903 by Canadian Renaissance man Norman Luxton. 
At the back of the shop is a glass case containing what appears to be the desiccated corpse of a merman. A note attached to this horrific exhibit describes an old stony story about a strange creature which lived in Lake Minnewanka, which was half human and half fish. Every once in a while, the legend contends, visitors to the lake can hear voices and drumming coming from beneath the water, these mysterious noises ostensibly having some connection with the lake's monstrous resident. It must be mentioned that the atrocity on display at the Banff Trading Post bears striking resemblance to the Fiji mermaid, a chimera-like abomination composed of the head and torso of a monkey sewn onto the body of a fish, which American showman P.T. Barnum exhibited in his museum in New York City. There are other native legends from the Rocky Mountains describing monstrous mermen that inhabit the lakes and rivers. One old stony story tells of two brothers, one of them good and the other bad, who were introduced to a monster called Wawaka after being flung by a tornado in the Rocky Mountains. The creature was described as having a scaly, fish-like tail, a bestial body covered with long black hair, and a human head with horns. After a series of adventures, the monster was killed by the brothers and roasted in a fire. The bad brother tasted some of the creature's cooked flesh, while the good brother did not. The bad brother soon began to spout coarse hair, horns on his head, and scales on his legs, eventually transforming completely into a Wawaka himself. Realizing that his personality was beginning to change, the bad brother begged his sibling to abandon him for his own safety, and slipped into a rocky mountain river. In the 1860s, the Rocky Mountains began to be invaded by white prospectors as part of the denouement of the ever-easterly succession of gold rushes which had characterized the previous decade. Back in 1858, hordes of Californian prospectors descended upon British Columbia's Fraser Canyon, drawn by news of a gold strike made at the confluence of the Fraser and Thompson Rivers. In 1861, at the tail end of this Fraser Canyon gold rush, News of a new bonanza to the northeast incited the Caribou Gold Rush, in which thousands of British, Canadian, and Chinese prospectors flocked to fresh diggings in what is known as Caribou Country. In 1864, a handful of Caribou prospectors who had wandered east of the boomtowns of Barkerville and Williams Lake discovered gold on Stud Horse Creek, a tributary of the Kootenai River, in the Columbia Mountains not far from the present cities of Kimberley and Cranbrook, B.C. When the Wild Horse Creek diggings appeared to be played out, some prospectors ventured further east into the Rocky Mountains. There, they were joined by wolfers, whiskey traders, and other hard characters who traveled north from the Montana frontier, many of whom had searched for the yellow metal in the hills outside Bannock, who were eager to try their luck in one of the last great gold rushes of the Wild West. Two of the region's most famous prospectors, responsible for what has been called the greatest mystery of the Canadian Rockies, our characters cloaked in Enigma, an ill-fated pair known only as Lemon and Blackjack, the former giving his name to a legendary bonanza known as the Lost Lemon Mine. Although there are many different versions of this legend, all agree on one point, that there is a wealth of lost gold hidden somewhere on the eastern slopes of Canada's Rocky Mountains. According to the best-known version of this legend, Sometime around 1870, a 35-member prospecting party set out from the Tobacco Plains north of Eureka, Montana, in the valley of the Kootenai River, to pan the North Saskatchewan River for gold. Among them was a seasoned gold seeker known as Blackjack and his partner, Lemon. After some fruitless panning on the North Saskatchewan, Blackjack and Lemon decided to search for brighter prospects. For protection against the Blackfoot, who had no qualms about slaughtering Americans who trespassed on their territory, they joined a party of southbound Métis, led by one Emile Lanouse. In some versions of the story, these half-breeds were headed for Fort Standoff, a whiskey post built at the confluence of the Old Man and Waterton Rivers. Somewhere around present-day Nantin, Alberta, Black Jack and Lemon separated from the group and followed an old stony pack trail up High River and into the mountains, hoping to find a mountain pass that led to the Wild Horse Creek goldfields. The partners left the trail to follow a creek, which proved to be the confluence of three smaller streams. They panned these headwaters and discovered, to their delight, that their beds were rich in gold dust. After some additional investigation, they stumbled upon the source, a rock ledge streaked with solid gold. 
That night, Blackjack and Lemon got into a heated argument over whether they should avail themselves of the gold immediately and take out as much as they could carry, or return to civilization and recruit miners to help them liberate the whole load from its terrestrial prison. The exchange became so intense that the two prospectors nearly came to blows. Eventually, the livid partners decided to retire for the night. Blackjack slowly nodded off, while Lemon, wide awake, lay fuming. When he was sure that Blackjack was asleep, Lemon quietly slipped from his blankets, crept over to his sleeping partner, and split Blackjack's head with an axe. When he realized what he had done, Lemon was overwhelmed with panic. Resolving to abandon the camp at first light, he built a huge fire and started pacing back and forth, rifle in hand, brooding fearfully. As he did so, he began to hear ghostly moans, eerie whistles, and hideous lamentations, faintly superseding the crackling of the fire. Horrified, Lemon feared that he was being haunted by the spirit of his murdered partner. The uncanny wail sent him on a slow descent into borderline insanity, a state from which he would never fully recover. Unbeknownst to the terrified prospector, the ghastly wails were issued by two young stony braves who tormented the unsuspecting lemon from concealment in the brush. One storyteller identified these native pranksters as William and Daniel Bendo, while another called them Calf Child and Medicine Owl, perhaps using the anglicized forms of their stony names. The Indians had been stalking Lemon and Blackjack for some time, and had witnessed their discovery of the gold, their argument, and Blackjack's subsequent murder. At dawn, the half-crazed Lemon set out for the Tobacco Plains, or, in another version of the story, the St. Ignatius Jesuit Mission, south of Flathead Lake. Upon his departure, the two natives took what valuables they could from the camp, and headed to the stony village at Morley, where they told their story to Chief Jacob Bearspaw. Wary of the implications of a gold rush on stony land, the chief swore the two braves to secrecy. After several days, Lemon arrived at his destination and sought out his friend, a priest named Father LaRue. During his subsequent confession, he showed the priest a sample of the gold-rich rock from the mine he and Blackjack had discovered, which traders at Fort Benton, an American fur company trading post on Montana's Missouri River, would later describe as a body of solid gold with a little rock shut into it. Immediately, the priest tasked a Métis frontiersman named John McDougall with finding Lemon's mine and giving the murdered prospector a Christian burial. The mountain man found the location without much trouble and buried Blackjack's remains, erecting a stone cairn over the grave. As soon as he left for Tobacco Plains, a group of Bear's Paw men, who had secretly been keeping watch over the spot, destroyed the cairn and all evidence of human activity. The following spring, a party of miners, having heard of Lemon's find, convinced the remorseful prospector to lead them to the mine's location. Try as he might, however, the mentally fragile prospector was unable to retrace his steps. After a fruitless search, the miners began to believe that Lemon was deceiving them and confronted him accordingly. In response, Lemon became violently unhinged and had to be restrained and escorted back to Tobacco Plains. No longer able to function in civilized society, Lemon went to live on his brother's ranch in Texas, where he remained until his death. After the failed expedition, Father LaRue took it upon himself to reclaim the mine. In 1872, he outfitted a party of miners who were to be led by John McDougall, the man who had buried Blackjack. The party headed to Crow's Nest Lake and waited for McDougall, who was at Fort Benton at the time. When he had finished his business, McDougall set out to meet the party. En route, he stopped at Fort Kip and indulged in the post's most infamous commodity, a dangerous rotgut pseudo whiskey frequently sold to the Indians. That night, McDougall drank himself to death, taking the secret of the mine's location to his grave. Some years later, the quest for the Lost Lemon Mine was taken up by Lafayette French, an American buffalo hunter, fur trader, and rancher who set up shop on the Highwood River near present-day High River, Alberta, sometime in the 1880s. During his first expedition into the mountains in search of the fabled treasure, French contracted some mysterious ailment and returned home, grievously ill. For the next 30 years, French made sporadic treks into the mountains in search of Lemon's lost gold. Despite the assistance he received from members of previous search parties, French was ultimately unsuccessful. 
The longer he searched, the more he gained the impression that some sort of curse plagued those who sought the gold, or at least those who got close to finding it. This disturbing notion never presented itself more starkly than in a string of instances that began near Pincher Creek, Alberta, just east of Crow's Nest Pass, and ended in High River more than 70 miles to the north. One cold winter day, a party of Stony Indians led by William Bendo, one of the two braves who had witnessed Blackjack's murder, took shelter on a ranch near Pincher Creek belonging to a pioneer named William Samuel Lee. French, who was coincidentally visiting the ranch at the same time, gave the hungry native and his followers some of his own beef. When he asked Bendo about the lost gold, the stony became uncharacteristically tight-lipped and refused to disclose any information. That spring, French presented Bendo with 25 horses and 25 cattle and promised to give them to the stony on the condition that he bring him to the site of Blackjack's murder. Initially, Bendo agreed that it was arranged that the party would head out in the morning. That night, the Indian was racked by superstitious terror, and at sunrise he reneged on the bargain. In the winter of 1912, future Albertan Senator Dan Riley, who was working as a carpenter at the time, outfitted French for another prospecting venture. On his way to the mountains, French crossed paths with Bendo a second time, finding the Indian on his way to Morley with a number of his friends and relatives. He made Bendo another generous offer, and the Stoney once again agreed to lead him to the lost gold. That very night, Bendo died suddenly and mysteriously, in a fit of convulsions. Convinced that the Indian had brought bad medicine upon himself by agreeing to reveal the tribe's secrets, his kinsman loaded his body into a Red River cart and brought it back to Morley for interment. The stony superstition regarding precious metals, clearly exhibited by Bendo and other members of his band, is alluded to in Walter Wilcox's 1900 book, The Rockies of Canada. In that publication, the author relates a story featuring Joe Healy, an Irish-born adventurer and brother of the powerful whiskey trader John J. Healy. While prospecting on the Bull River in 1864, Healy induced a stony man named Edwin to take him to a place in the mountains where there was copper ore, bribing him with blankets, flour, and tea. The other Indians shook their heads, Wilcox wrote, and said that the spirits would be angry and that something would surely happen to Edwin for disturbing the minerals. Later that autumn, just prior to their scheduled expedition, Edwin suddenly fell dead beside his fire, apparently succumbing to a heart attack. To the elders, his death was no great surprise, being a natural consequence of his decision to show the white man where there is money in the rocks. Similar sentiments were held by the Stony of Morley, who attributed William Bendo's sudden demise to preternatural forces. Their suspicions were confirmed when, on the night that Bendo's body was returned to the village, the dead man's son-in-law perished in the same mysterious manner. Despite these ominous developments, French decided to proceed with his planned expedition and headed into the mountains alone. Several weeks later, the treasure hunter stumbled into the famous Bar U Ranch in the Albertan foothills in an obvious state of excitement. Fumbling for a pencil and paper, he scrawled a cryptic letter to a friend at Fort Benton, stating that he had found it and would explain everything when he had the opportunity. After entrusting the letter to the proprietor of the establishment, he rode further west, deciding to spend the night in an old log cabin about two miles from the Beddingfeld Ranch in High River. Sometime that night, the cabin mysteriously caught fire. French was severely burned, but managed to escape with his life and crawled two miles in the snow to the Beddingfeld Ranch for aid. By the time of his arrival, it was morning, and the ranch hands were already in the field. Exhausted and in severe pain, the wounded frontiersman crawled into the bunkhouse, hauled himself into one of the bunks, and passed out. That evening, after supper, as the cowboys sat around playing cards in the bunkhouse, a weak voice emanated from the bunks. A little less noise, gentlemen, please. There is a very sick man in this bunk. The startled cowhands lowered the prospector from the bed, bundled him into a wagon, and brought him to High River for medical attention. By the time they reached their destination, French was in grave condition. The dying prospector requested to see Dan Riley, who arrived at his bedside as soon as he heard the news. I know all about the lost lemon mine now, he whispered. French, who wanted nothing more than to close his eyes, 
promised to tell Riley the whole story in the morning. Unfortunately, he never had the opportunity. The prospector died that night, taking the secret of his discovery to the grave. There have been many ideas put forth over the years as to the location of the Lost Lemon Mine. Most stories place it somewhere in the Livingstone Range, at the eastern edge of the Rockies between the Highwood River and the Crow's Nest Pass. Another tale contends that the elusive load lies in a valley in Red Lodge Provincial Park west of Sundry, Alberta, 50 miles north of Morley, where King Bearspaw, the disowned grandson of Chief Jacob Bearspaw, is reputed to have spent decades searching for it. And one fascinating theory developed by Stephen Wright, a resident of Alberta's Bow Valley, places the hidden treasure near Mount Assiniboine, on the Alberta-BC border, just west of the Spray Lakes. Wherever its location, the cursed gold of Lemon and Blackjack adds another layer of intrigue to the enigma that is the Canadian Rockies. Canada's brief and fiery Wild West came to an end in 1874, when the government of the seven-year-old Dominion of Canada sent the Northwest Mounted Police to the Western Plains to establish British law and order. Seven years later, European navvies and Chinese coolies, under the leadership of William Cornelius Van Horn, began construction on the Canadian Pacific Railway, or CPR, the great iron thoroughfare that would connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. In 1884, on the recommendation of surveyor and former U.S. Cavalry officer Major A.B. Rogers, the railroad is built through the Rocky Mountains by way of the perilous Kicking Horse Pass. After laying ties and rails over this divide, the CPR's workforce of underpaid laborers continued building the road along the northern routes of adjacent Mount Stephen, creating a steep and dangerous declivity which would come to be known as the Big Hill. Before it was replaced by the spiral tunnels in 1909, this eight-mile horror, as historian Pierre Burton put it, was responsible for a series of deadly disasters, one of which is connected with an eerie Rocky Mountain mystery. In July 1962, one Julie C. Crawford, the daughter of a senior CPR locomotive engineer named Matthew Fulton Crawford, published an article about her father's strange experiences on the Canadian Pacific Railway. The last of Julie's stories is set in January 1904, when both her father and her easygoing uncle, John Jack Ladner, were working out of the city of Revelstoke, British Columbia, on an alpine route which stretched from that city to Lagin, Alberta, the site of present-day Lake Louise. This mountain passage was both beautiful and dangerous, consisting of a series of switchbacks that wound through both the Albertan Rockies and BC's Columbia Range, snaking through Rogers Pass and up the deadly Big Hill. In order to traverse this treacherous trail, locomotives required the assistance of an auxiliary engine, or pusher. Although the pusher job was monotonous, it paid well, and so Jack Ladner opted to work exclusively in the auxiliary engines in order to provide his family with some extra income. Matthew Crawford had spent the evening of January 21, 1904, with his in-laws in Revelstoke. Knowing that he had to work in the morning, he kept his visit short. When the time came for him to say goodnight, Mrs. Ladner gave him a pair of hand-knit wrist warmers and asked him to give them to her son Jack if he managed to see him at Lagan, or at the station in Field, B.C., at the summit of the route. All the way east the next day, Julie wrote, Dad was glad his mother-in-law could not see the mountains as they looked in the intense cold menacing, implacable. The track was in fair condition, for the big rotary plow had preceded the passenger train, and he was right on time when he pulled into Field Station at the summit at 6 o'clock. Sure enough, Jack Ladner was present at the Field Station at the time of Matthew's arrival, and watched his train crawl into the station. No sooner had the locomotive come to a stop than Jack swung into the cab to give his brother-in-law a hearty hello. After exchanging news, Matthew gave Jack the wrist warmers his mother had knitted for him, and showed him a new pocket watch he had purchased, of which he was very proud. The case isn't much, he said, but it's 21 jeweled, the best works I could afford, and guaranteed to keep perfect time. After chatting for some time, the two men parted ways, Matthew to continue his journey to Lagan, and Jack bound for Revelstoke, with a load of heavy freight. Jack be extra careful going down the hill, Matthew cautioned. It's a bad night, and if you've got a heavy train, you may have some trouble. It's slippery now, and the track's getting worse all the time. Hold her tight. Thanks, Matt, Jack replied. 
You're always looking out for me, but I've gone down the hill in a lot of blizzards this winter. I'm getting used to it. Besides, if the train starts to run away, there's always the safety switches. Nothing could happen once the train got in them. I'll be alright. But if I don't get there, I'll find a way to let you know. This last remark was a reference to Jack's oft-repeated insistence that, if he ever met a sticky end on the railroad, as he strongly supposed he would, he would do everything in his ghostly power to let Matthew know about it. Matthew's journey to Logan was uneventful. When his work was complete, he headed to the station boarding house for a hot meal, and an evening of banter and camaraderie with his fellow trainmen. In the midst of the after-dinner conversation, Matthew, eager to show off his new pocket watch, drew his timepiece from his pocket and showed it to the men with whom he was chatting, saying casually, It's not much to look at because I didn't splurge on the case, but it keeps perfect. Rather than displaying the correct time, however, the watch was stopped at 7.56. While the trainman jokingly disparaged the jeweler who had sold him the watch, Matthew attempted to move the hands ahead to the correct time. Bizarrely, they refused to budge, glued resolutely to 7.56. Suddenly, Matthew was struck by a hideous hunch. Pushing back his chair, he shrugged into his coat and set out for the station, ignoring the laughs and jeers of his fellow trainmen as he headed into the cold. Halfway to the station, he ran into the operator, who had just searched for him at the bunkhouse. With a heavy heart, the operator informed him that Jack's train had ran off the rails, having broken through two safety switches. It broke its descent by slamming head-on into a huge rock. Rescuers on the scene had yet to find any sign of Jack or his firemen. Matthew spent the ensuing week working on the wrecking crew, searching for any sign of his missing brother-in-law on the mountainside. Three days later, Jack's broken body was discovered beneath the twisted metal of the ruined engine. His own pocket watch had stopped at 7.56, the exact same time as Matthew's, as had the clock on the second safety switch through which the train had broken. Although Jack's pocket watch and the clock on the safety switch ran perfectly well once they were rewound, Matthew's watch never worked again, its hands pointing obstinately to the very minute at which Jack had met his untimely demise. Matthew later brought the watch to two different jewelers, who determined that there was nothing wrong with any of its components. They were unable to ascertain why it had stopped in the first place, and why it refused to resume its regular function. Julie explained that one of her uncle's friends implored her father to leave the watch as it was, and never attempt to use it again. And he didn't, she wrote. It still is in the family, its hands fixed at the hour when my uncle left this world so tragically. Naturally, the watch was talked about for a long time, whenever two railroaders met, and it was not unusual to have perfect strangers come to the house and say, I work for the CPR out of Calgary, or Moose Jaw, or Brandon. We heard that you have the watch that stopped when your brother-in-law was killed. Can we see it? And Dad would show it, and tell the story again. Coincidence? Maybe. But Dad said that Jack had kept his promise, and had let him know the exact minute he had reached the end of his earthly run. The curious case of Jack Ladner's pocket watch is not the only Rocky Mountain mystery connected with the Canadian Pacific Railway. Back in 1888, William Cornelius Van Horn, the man who oversaw the construction of that transcontinental track, was appointed president of the CPR. With the dream of attracting wealthy European tourists seeking a luxury wilderness experience, Van Horn envisioned a castle in the Rockies, a grand railway hotel towering above the confluence of the Bow and Spray Rivers in the quaint mountain town of Banff. During the first year of his presidency, he commissioned American architect Bruce Price with the design of a world-class establishment that would become an icon of the Canadian Rockies, the Banff Springs Hotel. Since its grand opening to the public, this magnificent Scottish baronial-styled palace, rebuilt in 1910 from the limestone of Mount Rundle, has housed guests from all over the world, among them Marilyn Monroe, Queen Elizabeth II, and Helen Keller. According to a number of legends, ostensibly born from the first-hand accounts of hotel patrons and staff, some of these guests never checked out. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel 
is home to a number of ghostly stories, all of which the hotel officially denies. At least one of the Banff Springs' supposed ghostly guests is said to haunt the missing room 873 on the 8th floor. According to hotel lore, a man, while staying with his wife and young daughter in room 873, murdered his family before committing suicide. As the story goes, the spirit of the young girl, and in some versions the spirit of her mother, never left the room. Guests who stayed in room 873 after its reopening reported being awoken in the night by violent shrieks, and chambermaids who routinely cleaned the room would report finding bloody fingerprints on the bathroom mirror that could not be washed off. In response to the disturbing reports, hotel management sealed off the room, the vicinity of which is said to be haunted to this very day. Another of the permanent residents reported to walk the halls of the Bam Springs is the ghost of Sam McCauley, a beloved Scottish bellman who, before his death in the mid-late 1970s, swore to posthumously return to haunt his workplace. Incidents involving mysterious phantom lights, elevator doors opening and closing at random, and hotel guests being helped by an elderly Scottish bellman in an antiquated uniform have been attributed to Sam's ghost. Other alleged hotel specters include a ghostly bartender who encourages inebriated patrons to go to bed, and a headless man who, despite his obvious handicap, somehow manages to play the bagpipes. Of all the ghost stories associated with the Banff Springs Hotel, perhaps the best known is the tale of the Phantom Bride. According to legend, a young couple was married in Banff sometime in the early 1930s. It was arranged for their wedding banquet to be held in the Banff Springs Hotel, where the couple was renting the bridal suite. Before the banquet commenced, the newlywed bride ascended the marble staircase up to the Cascade Ballroom to join her husband, who was waiting at the top. As she did so, her wedding gown brushed against one of the candles that lined the curved staircase and caught fire. In the panic that ensued, the bride tripped over her wedding dress, fell down the flight of marble stairs, broke her neck, and died. It is said that her ghost has haunted the hotel ever since. Over the years, various hotel patrons and staff have reported seeing a phantasmal bride dancing alone in the Cascade Ballroom, or ascending the marble staircase on which the tragic event is rumored to have taken place. Others have heard strange noises emanating from the bridal suite when the room was not in use. True or not, the tale of the ghostly bride of the Bam Springs Hotel is surrounded in an aura of mystery and romance that has become entrenched in the folklore of Canada's Rocky Mountains. Forty minutes up the Icefield Parkway from Banff is the hamlet of Lake Louise, named after an iconic glacial lake which lies at the foot of Mount Lefroy. Towering over the lake's northeastern end is another of the CPR's Grand Railway Hotels, the Fairmont Chateau Lake Louise. Built around the turn of the 20th century, this luxury establishment has ghost stories of its own, some of which were shared with me by a former hotel employee named Katie M. Like the Banff Springs, the Chateau Lake Louise has an elevator that inexplicably opens and closes on its own. This rogue lift is located near the staff cafeteria at the back of the hotel, in an area with crimson carpet known as the Red Room. Staff lore has it that, back in the 1920s or 30s, when the area was open to guests, a young boy fell into the open shaft while running after a rolling ball and died from his injuries. Around the corner from the Red Room is a corridor connected to the staff cafeteria, on which hangs a large mirror. While passing by this ornament, one of Katie's fellow staff members glanced at his own reflection and saw an older man standing behind him, staring at him with a sinister expression. The staff member whirled around, only to find himself alone in the hallway. Another purportedly haunted area is the hotel's eighth floor, where one of Katie's housekeeping supervisors was kicked squarely in the behind. Legend has it that this part of the Chateau Lake Louise is haunted by the ghost of a bride-to-be, who hanged herself in a guest room closet sometime in the 1930s when she learned of her fiancé's affair. Another unusual incident occurred one night when a guest left the hotel for a nighttime stroll around the lake. When he tried to re-enter the door he had exited, the guest found himself locked outside. When he peered through the window to see if anyone was in the hallway, the face of an elderly woman in old-fashioned clothing suddenly appeared in front of him. Terrified, the patron walked around to the main doors and informed the concierge of his frightening experience. 
Another interesting source on the ghosts of the Chateau Lake Louise is an online post written by former hotel house officer P. Herman. One night while doing his rounds, Herman and a co-worker named Robert walked the length of the Tom Wilson Room, a restaurant on the hotel's seventh floor. It was very late at night, he wrote. Dark, of course, but for a few nightlights. Herman and Robert strolled down the middle of the dining room, walking between rows of tables and chairs, with their eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. When they had completed their inspection, they turned around to find every chair in the dining room moved to the middle of the aisle down which they had just walked. We heard nothing, he wrote, although there was a very noticeable chill. Of course, we chose an alternate route through the kitchen at a very brisk pace. Herman went on to relate another incident, in which he walked past a woman in old-fashioned summer clothing, one cold winter night while descending the grand staircase. The woman's strange choice of attire caused the house officer to turn around for a second look, but by the time he craned his neck, the woman had vanished. Similar to his experience in the Tom Wilson room, the incident was accompanied by an oppressive chill, which Herman likened to the sensation of opening a winter window without feeling a breeze. Of course, I made my report, he wrote, and it should be on file to this day, along with several others, including screams in empty rooms and other apparitions. The most famous spectral resident of the Chateau Lake Louise is that of Thomas Edmonds Wilson, the namesake of the aforementioned restaurant. Wilson was a frontiersman who worked as a Northwest Mounted Police officer a packer for railroad surveyor Major A.B. Rogers, and an independent mountain guide in the Canadian Rockies, who, in 1882, became the first white man to lay eyes on Lake Louise. After his death in 1933, Wilson's spirit is said to have returned to the place he loved best. Patrons have reported seeing a specter bearing his likeness, gazing out at Lake Louise from the restaurant that bears his name, and staff claim to have seen his ghostly figure striding through the kitchen at night his legs disappearing into the floor from the knees down. This detail adds authenticity to sightings, as the kitchen floor was purportedly a foot lower than its present height when a living Tom Wilson walked the halls of the Chateau Lake Louise. Tucked away in the southwestern corner of the Canadian Rockies lies Waterton Lakes National Park, a hidden tourist destination which has hosted thousands of sportsmen and outdoor adventurers since the days of its first ranger, Kootenay Brown. On a high, windswept hill, overlooking the park's eponymous lakes, stands the magnificent Prince of Wales Hotel, the last of the Grand Railway Hotels to be built on Canadian soil. In the summer months, this historic Swiss chalet-style landmark houses guests from all over the world, come to hike the perilous Crypt Lake Trail, cruise the lakes by boat, or simply enjoy the breathtaking scenery of the Rockies' smallest park. In the fall and winter, the Prince of Wales lies desolate and abandoned, its windows dark, its doors boarded up, and the wind howling through gaps in its wooden exterior. In this eerie condition, the hotel appears more congruous with its many ghost stories, an attribute which all of Canada's Grand Railway hotels seem to share. The Prince of Wales Hotel was built in 1926 at the behest of Louis W. Hill, president of the American company the Great Northern Railway. At that time, alcohol was outlawed in the United States, and many thirsty Americans made pilgrimages to the Great White North to indulge in their favorite beverages, Alberta having ended its own prohibition in 1923. Hill, who had built several grand railway hotels in neighboring Glacier National Park, Montana, hoped that a similar hotel in Waterton might entice American liquor tourists to visit southwestern Alberta, utilizing his railway and U.S. hotels on the journey north. It is somewhat ironic that Hill's Waterton Hotel, built for the express purpose of attracting liquor tourism, is located right beside the Mormon-heavy counties of Cardston and Warner, the only districts in Alberta where alcohol is still outlawed. Named after the future, short-reigning King Edward VIII, in a vain attempt to entice him to stay there during his 1927 royal tour of Canada, the Prince of Wales Hotel is said to house a number of permanent residents. The most frequently reported unexplained phenomenon to take place at the Prince of Wales Hotel 
is the inexplicable aroma of tobacco smoke, which occasionally wafts through the royal steward's dining room. This phantom smell is said to be associated with the ghost of a well-dressed, top-hat-wearing gentleman who haunts the dining room and the basement, appearing to unsuspecting guests and staff as a reflection in the windows and mirrors. Although some writers have attempted to connect this specter with a construction worker who allegedly fell from some scaffolding to his death during the hotel's construction, the image of a dapper tobacco smoker corresponds quite well with that of Captain Rodden S. Harrison, the hotel's first manager, a pipe smoker who frequently affected a tweed suit. Captain Harrison is said to have taken great pride in his work and had his staff furnish the tables in the Royal Stewart dining room with freshly picked wildflowers every morning. Perhaps the captain's spirit resides in the hotel to this day, enjoying the occasional after-dinner smoke and periodically checking in on his guests. Another of the Prince of Wales' resident spirits is said to haunt the lobby, where hotel staff sometimes report hearing the heavy, disembodied footsteps of a man in the middle of the night. One former staff member in an internet chat room confessed that he broke into the hotel in the off-season in order to spend the night there. His intrusion apparently offended this invisible resident, who raced down the stairs from the fifth or sixth floor and across the lobby towards him, effectively chasing him from the premises. The most famous phantom of the Prince of Wales Hotel is the Lady in White, the specter of a young woman in a white gown set to haunt rooms 510 and 516. This feminine phantasm makes her presence known by locking windows left open overnight, running the taps, tapping on doors, turning the lights on, and blowing her icy breath down the necks of hapless guests. Some hotel patrons have reported hearing disembodied footsteps in the hallways or on the balconies. Others claim to have been locked out of their own rooms, finding that someone or something had locked the door from the inside. One guest staying in room 516 even maintained that the apparition of a young woman slipped into bed with him and his wife in the dead of night, before vanishing into thin air. Popular legend attributes this phantom to the spirit of a young chambermaid named Sarah, who started working at the hotel shortly after its grand opening in 1927. Sarah was in love with a member of the hotel staff. When the man rejected her advances, Sarah lapsed into despair and threw herself from a window on the fourth floor. Her ghost remains in the hotel to this very day, haunting the site of her suicide. It is likely that the legend of Sarah's ghost is based on a tragic event that took place in 1977, a particularly dark year for the Prince of Wales Hotel, on account of the death of a beloved hotel handyman and a disruptive government inspection. Perhaps the most tragic event to take place that year was the suicide of a 20-year-old seasonal employee from Dorval, Quebec, who worked in the hotel's gift shop. The employee, named Lorraine, had fallen in love with Clifford Hummel, the handsome and athletic manager of the Prince of Wales Hotel. When Hummel, who was already in a relationship at the time, failed to reciprocate her affections, Lorraine was heartbroken. On Saturday, June 30th, 1977, the grief-stricken woman stripped naked and ran throughout the hotel before leaping to her death from the balcony on the hotel's sixth floor. Her broken body was discovered on the flagstone patio that overlooks the Waterton Lakes. Some say that, ever since, her restless spirit has roamed the halls of the Prince of Wales, searching for the love denied her in life. In addition to the construction of the Grand Railway Hotels, the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1885 allowed for the settlement of the Western Prairies in the British Columbian interior. By the early 20th century, outdoor adventurers from across the country were regularly heading into the Rockies to hunt, fish, and mountain climb. Some of these sportsmen returned from their backcountry escapades with experiences they could not explain, which seemed to suggest that the old Indian legends of hairy giants in the Rocky Mountains might have some truth to them. One of the best 20th century wildman stories to come out of the Canadian Rockies is the testament of William Rowe, a construction worker from British Columbia, who had an incredible encounter in the autumn of 1955 when he was helping build the Yellowhead Highway west of Jasper. Rowe sent his sworn affidavit to Canadian Sasquatch researcher John William Green, in which he outlined his experience. Green, in turn, published Rowe's stories in two of his books, cementing its place in the annals of classic Bigfoot literature. 
Ever since I was a small boy, back in the forests of Michigan, Roe began, in the opening paragraph of his testimony, I have studied the lives and habits of wild animals. Later, when I supported my family in northern Alberta by hunting and trapping, I spent many hours just observing the wild things. They fascinated me. But the most incredible experience I ever had with a wild creature occurred near a little town called Tetjun Cache, British Columbia, about 80 miles west of Jasper, Alberta. In October 1955, I decided to climb five miles up Micah Mountain to an old deserted mine, just for something to do. I came inside of the mine about three o'clock in the afternoon, after an easy climb. I had just come out of a patch of low brush into a clearing when I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear in the bush on the other side. I had shot a grizzly near that spot a year before. This one was about 75 yards away, but I didn't want to shoot it, for I had no way of getting it out, so I sat down on a small rock and watched, my rifle in my hands. When Roe first spotted the animal, it was obscured by brush, giving him a clear view of its head and the top of one of its shoulders only. As he watched, the creature stood up on its hind legs and strode out into a clearing, shattering the hunter's comfortable illusion. My first impression was of a huge man, Roe wrote, about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown silver-tipped hair, but as it came closer, I saw by its breasts that it was a female and yet its torso was not curved like a female's. Its broad frame was straight from shoulder to hip. Its arms were much thicker than a man's arms, and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Its feet were broader proportionately than a man's, about five inches wide at the front, and tapering to much thinner heels. When it walked, it placed the heel of its foot down first, and I could see the grey-brown skin or hide on the soles of its feet. The creature walked over to the bush in which Roe had concealed himself, and squatted down on its haunches within twenty feet of the hunter. It proceeded to eat the bush's leaves, gripping them with its huge hands, and pulling them towards its mouth. Roe stated that the wild woman's lips curled flexibly around the leaves as it ate. Fascinated, Roe studied the animal's features as it enjoyed its afternoon snack, apparently oblivious to his presence. The shape of the creature's head somewhat resembled a negro's, the hunter wrote. Its head was higher at the back than at the front. The nose was broad and flat. The lips and chin protruded farther than its nose, but the hair that covered it, leaving bare only the parts of its face around the mouth, nose, and ears, made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of this hair, even on the back of its head, was longer than an inch, and that on its face was much shorter. Its ears were shaped like a human's ears, but its eyes were small and black like a bear's and its neck was also unhuman, thicker and shorter than any man's I had ever seen. Roe also noted that the creature's teeth were white and even. Suddenly, the wild woman glanced in Roe's direction, apparently having caught his scent. A look of amazement crossed its face, the hunter wrote. It looked so comical at the moment I had to grin. Still in a crouched position, it backed up three or four steps, then straightened up to its full height and started to walk rapidly back the way it had come. For a moment, it watched me over its shoulder as it went, not exactly afraid, but as though it wanted no contact with anything strange. Roe considered shooting the creature as it stalked back into the bush, keenly cognizant of the fact that one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the 20th century was only a trigger's pull away. I leveled my rifle, he wrote. The creature was still walking rapidly away, again turning its head to look in my direction. I lowered the rifle. Although I have called the creature it, I felt now that it was a human being, and I knew I would never forgive myself if I killed it. Just as it came to the other patch of brush, Roe continued, it threw its head back and made a peculiar noise that seemed to be half laugh and half language, and which I can only describe as a sort of whinny. Then it walked from the small brush into a stand of lodgepole pine. Roe stepped out into the clearing hoping to catch another glimpse of the creature, and was rewarded with the sight of the wild woman, now standing several hundred yards away, tipping her head back again to emit the same strange call she had made before. Having delivered her incomprehensible message, the creature disappeared into the trees. 
Another series of Rocky Mountain monster sightings were made in the late 1960s and early 70s at the Kootenai Plains south of Nordegg, Alberta, where Stony Medicine Man Hector Crawler had spent much of his time hunting in the late 19th century. In March 1969, a Cree Indian band from Hobima, Alberta, set up camp at a place called Windy Point, near the confluence of the North Saskatchewan and Klein Rivers. No sooner had they settled in than a 62-year-old band member named Mark Yellowbird caught a glimpse of a huge, dark, hairy man flitting through the trees. Yellowbird had heard stories of such creatures from his stony friend, the late Chief Walking Eagle, former head of the nearby Bighorn Reserve. He told his friends of these things, Yellowbird told reporters, but he didn't mention them to anybody else because he knew he would be laughed at. In the months following Yellowbird's encounter, Cree campers would wake up in the morning to find huge footprints skirting the edge of their camp a few hundred yards from their tents and teepees, made by at least two different creatures. In June, Mark Yellowbird's daughter, 16-year-old Edith Yellowbird, saw four strange figures on the slopes above Windy Point. I think they had caught something, she told reporters. Two were bending down, and the other two were just walking about nearby. They were as tall as good-sized spruce trees on the mountainside on which they were standing. Shortly after Yellowbird's experience, a native laborer named Alex Shortneck was clearing timber with a felling axe on the North Saskatchewan River north of the Cree camp, at a site where the Bighorn Dam now stands, when he became aware of a huge, hairy, man-like creature standing about 50 yards away, watching him. I didn't know what to do, he told reporters. I just went on chopping wood. It disappeared. I thought it best to just go about my business. On August 24, 1969, while working at a pump house just north of the woodcutter's siding, a 17-year-old cement finisher named Harley Peterson, who hailed from Condor, Alberta, spotted a mysterious, hairy, human-like figure, about twice or thrice the size of an ordinary man, watching him from a ridge overlooking the river. It looked enormous, he later told reporters. Its head was bent slightly forward, and it looked very hefty. Harley pointed the figure out to his father and fellow contractor, 46-year-old Stan Peterson. Soon, the father and son were joined by three more Albertan companions, 19-year-old Guy LaRue of Rocky Mountain House, 46-year-old Floyd Engen of Eckville, and 21-year-old Dale Body of Pinoka. The five men stared at the creature for about half an hour, and the creature stared right back, ignoring their occasional shouts and waves. After sitting down for about ten minutes, the huge hairy figure stood up again, stared at the workmen for another fifteen minutes, and then walked along a ridge overlooking the North Saskatchewan River. We watched it for about three quarters of a mile as it made its way around a ridge, Harvey Peterson said. It was too tall and its legs too thin for a bear, said Dale Body of the mysterious woodland resident, whose fellow workmen estimated its height to be between twelve and fifteen feet. And a bear couldn't have walked that far on its hind legs, and not at that speed. It looked as if it was taking six-foot strides and covered the distance in less than two minutes. I just didn't believe it, said Angan of a strange experience. I had heard all sorts of stories and just didn't believe them. I took off my glasses and looked again, but there it was. I knew I was wide awake. I jumped up on a tractor and waved my hat at it and yelled. It didn't seem to notice. Angan described the creature as being dark in color, having round shoulders, and being covered with hair. The silent vales and misty peaks of the Canadian Rockies hold many more secrets, from unsolved disappearances and obscure native legends to strange phenomena which surround the sites of terrible disasters. At this junction of the magnificent and the mysterious, where nature's ancient parapets separate rugged luxury from hidden wilds where man's shadow is seldom cast, History and legend beckon to the adventurous, daring the bold and the curious to explore the mysteries of Canada's Rocky Mountains.